Thank you for the great introduction. Um, as Alexander mentioned, um, this is a very special moment. Two years ago, well, one and a half years ago, I started out speaking at Python conferences. And it was the first time I get in touch with the Python community. And it feels really surreal to be able to give the keynote here um, with all of you today. So thank you for the opportunity. And hope everybody had a good time today. Without further ado, let's get started. We're talking about public speaking today. Why you should pursue public speaking and how to get there. About me, my name is Yenny Cheng, originally from Hong Kong, and right now I'm an engineering manager at Yelp in Hamburg. This is your menu for today. We're going to be talking about why we want to talk about public speaking in the first place. And if it's that good, how can we overcome this fear? Stage fright, it's pretty scary. How can we get better at public speaking? And practically, where do we get started? I'm very interested in the topic of public speaking. And so I've interviewed a lot of my colleagues about their views on this. We have prepared a video for you, and please sit back and enjoy. Hey, hi. My name is Mario. Hi, my name is Rashik. I'm Samuel. My name is Tyriak. I'm Nicola. Oh, I'm Antoine. Hello, I'm Birgit. Hello, uh, my name is Yasmin. My name is Chidi Abere, Nadi. Um, short form is Chidi. I've been working here at Yelp for about a year and a half now. I'm currently a working student uh, at Yelp. I'm a product designer intern at Yelp in Hamburg office. I'm kind of working at Yelp by a kind of long time and pretty liking what I'm doing. Mostly working on backend, but he's you know, also thinking on how to break stuff. Andre Engineer, Core Mobile API team. I work here at Yelp at the user operations team in the Hamburg office. I moved to Yelp um, and Hamburg in Germany from Bangalore, which is a city in India uh, known as the Silicon Valley of India. I'm a product designer at Yelp here in Hamburg, uh, where we work on the business side of things. I'm working as a product manager here. Um, I have been working in the office for a pretty long time. I work at Yelp as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, also studying computer science at the Technical University in Berlin. I came here to Germany to actually explore different cultures, see how people live, work, eat, have fun, live life. So uh, I got into public speaking about three and a half years ago when uh, I started talking at small uh, conferences back in India. It was mostly Cocoa Heads and uh, so a bunch of us used to organize Cocoa Heads in Bangalore. My experience with public speaking has so far been pretty limited. I mean, other than experiences on presenting something within the team or within the company has not really been exposed to the public world. Usually I'm so concerned on recording and that's kind of one of the examples. is more about also thinking of, okay, what I have to share with the community that is not already state in the world is like, is that new or is just something old and doesn't really make sense to invest energy to re-say that? Uh, is that like a sort of a rhetorical question? Oh. Or I've, been, I've been doing like a lot of talks in the last uh, three or four years and I think it's, it's great. I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, as a product manager, I do public speaking presentations once a quarter or every now and then basically in front of the office or sometimes also for some bigger audience, including the San Francisco offices. It's great. So I was doing theater as a kid, so there is a lot of similarities, like this play and being in public, articulating your thoughts, being a little bit funny sometimes, engaging with the audience and everything. Majority of my public speaking experience has been related to my profession and I find that as I progressed in my career, more and more opportunities have presented themselves for me to speak publicly, like whether I want it or not. Um, talk to, you know, more junior people in the company about like, you know, like what we're doing, like our tech stack. I've just had to be more comfortable with speaking to, to people publicly, yeah. And I really like that feeling of people learning stuff and then attributing it that, uh, that to me. I think uh, a few months ago I had somebody come up to me and uh, she told me, hey, 
I, I was there two years ago when you gave that intro talk to Python and like that was the first time I actually learned Python and uh, and she was telling me hey th that made me like start programming more and now she got an internship at GitHub so like this is like really awesome to hear. Watch as they fall away. Do you think you're funny? I think I hope to be but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Every time before I start a talk there's a lot of you know butterflies in my tummy that's that's that effectively means i'm fairly scared i guess it's it's the case with the most seasoned public speakers as well almost everyone pretty much has given me the same you know answer yes <laughs> just check the video i do feel nervous every time when it comes to the actual event but i think that's just part of the game most of the time for me it's just like um, I either forget what I need to say or I just I just like freeze, you know. I was working on tickets and stuff at work and it was like, yeah, that's normal, that's easy. And then talking to people, I was realizing that eventually that wasn't easy, that it was eventually easy for me or easier for me. So maybe that is also a way, a thing that I need to learn, that is understanding that not everything that I see is simple, is simple and that everything that I don't think that is as hard as deserving to be discussed in front of people. Actually, it could be a nice topic to talk about. Yeah, it's actually very hard. Um, you would think as a meetup organizer that I get a lot of applications and I just filter them and choose the best ones. But most of what I'm doing is sourcing. So I, I look at other cities nearby and I look who spoke there. I look at the news in, well, design because it's a design meetup in my city and I try to find who is doing something interesting. So it's a lot of sourcing and trying to convince people to either give a talk they have or build a talk especially for us. So I think one of the things that I, that I found really work for me is to stand in front of the mirror and give your talk. I try to work on the way, uh, the way I um, brief rehearse the same talk at least three times uh, before I end up giving the talk anyway. It doesn't matter how large the audience is, even if it's a five or a six member audience, it's still important that you do not uh, break, <laughs> so as to speak. Do dry runs. Dry runs, dry runs, dry runs. I think it helps when you prepare yourself a lot, like when you practice um, how you want to say certain things, because um, whenever I try to do a dry run, I notice a lot of like, okay, I don't really know how I want to describe this, or I don't know the English word for that. Knowing that uh, the first time you're going to speak, it's going to suck. So uh, I think that's the best advice I got. My friend was like, he's, uh, he's been speaking for a lot of time for a long time, I think he's given hundreds of talks. And uh, the advice he gave me is, Mario, your first talk's gonna suck. While it sounds very cynical to give such a piece of advice, the important thing that it did was for me to lower my expectations of the talk, and the talk actually was great. I actually want to start by going to more conferences because like, that would be like, um, I think my first step to just like see other people public speaking, see the kind of thing they're talking about. I would just encourage people to just like, jump in the pool rather than thinking how they are going to um, enter it through this ladder and everything. Like jump straight into this and you'll figure out how to swim. All right, great. Hope you all enjoyed the video. And since I asked a lot of my colleagues about their experiences doing public speaking, I think it's also fair for me to give you a sense of um, why I like public speaking and how did I get started. So it has to start um, a few years ago. I remember in university, I was not half as keen about public speaking as I am right now. 
I remember the professor asking a question, you know, who wants to answer? I'll be sure to look away, look down, or send out any signal that I'm not ready to answer this question. I think whenever I talk in public, in front of people, something will go wrong. And plus, English is not my first language, so I always think that I cannot be as eloquent as people who speak it as the first language. But that has changed when I joined Yelp. That was my first job. And I remember my manager at that time gave me this feedback. Hey, Yanni, I think you have interesting things to share with the group. Do you want to speak up more in meetings? So that was when the, when I, but that moment was like when I realized that I need to get over this. I've missed out so many chances already just because I don't want to talk in front of people. But instead of trying to speak up a bit more in the next meeting or the next and the next, because you know, I tend to procrastinate, I decided to apply for PyCon Germany. And that was my first experience giving a public speaking talk. Oh, by the way, that video is still somewhere up there in YouTube, so I encourage you not to look it up, because the first talk is not always the perfect one, as Mario has mentioned. But hey, even when I haven't grasped all of the public speaking tricks, I feel like I have already been reaping a lot of the benefits out of it. So as expected, it's easier for me to talk in meetings and present in front of the company. When you feel more comfortable talking in front of 200 people or maybe right now 1,000 people, you just feel more natural to talk to your colleagues and they're more trusted as well. So that was easier. I got that out of the way. And as I progress in my career, I also realized that being a software engineer is not just sitting at your desk and code all day. It's a lot about communication and good ones too. For example, if you lead a project, it's a lot getting your stakeholders, um, your product managers, your engineers on the same page so that you know exactly what you're working on, what are the statuses. Even if you don't want to take on this role of leading a project, leading a team, even if you want to stay as a software engineer, when you have to design a system, you need to pitch to your colleague that that's the way to go, right? So it's also about communication. And talking about communication, I want to bring up the next point on crucial conversations. So I read the book called Crucial Conversations. The definition for this is when stakes are high, that means it's pretty important. And when emotions run strong, that means the atmosphere can be a bit charged when you have these kind of conversations. So what comes into mind is, for example, a salary negotiation. It's usually a little bit awkward, right? You think that you deserve a raise right now, and your manager thinks that you're not ready. Or you think that you're, it's the golden opportunity for you to lead this project, but the manager thinks that there is someone else who is a better candidate. So these kind of conversations is what I call crucial conversations. And actually, it resembles what we're doing here, public speaking, because First of all, like stakes are high. I definitely don't want to mess up in front of all of you. And emotions run strong because it's scary to be standing on stage. A lot of people have stage fright. And at the same time, since we're in the conference setting, I'll share this with you. It's a great trick for introverts to meet people. Instead of being awkward and be like, you know, hi, I'm Yanni, I'm from Yelp. Now, after I give the talk, people come to me and do this awkward thing, so I save some work definitely recommend for introverts in the audience. Now, I've given this talk for a couple times. I've also led a mentoring round circle on why we're afraid of public speaking. So here are some of the results I've got. Let's see if we can resonate with some of these reasons. First of all, is our heart racing. Like we all remember this one time before we have to go on stage and then your heart is pounding very hard, you're sweating, your stomach is feeling queasy, a lot of uh, nervousness building up in our system. And I would say that's only normal. This is what your body is, you know, believed in. For example, right now my body thinks that I'm in danger. I need to run away. So all the blood is being pumped to my legs right now, asking me to run away. But obviously my brain wants me to stay right here and talk to all of you. So one trick um, I'm trying is, ah, I think about last time I gave a talk, it was also pretty stressful on stage, but I managed, I survived, now I'm giving another talk. So it's totally okay. It's something that we can come to ter terms with. 
It's not your heart pounding or racing that scares you. It's how you react to this physical nervousness. Now there's another thing we can do, which is finding our harbor, something that's close to our heart, something that we really enjoy talking about. Because once you start talking about it, you forget where you are. You just really want to share what you want to share with the audience. And for me, you have already heard a lot about myself, so you know I like talking about myself. That's my harbor. But for you, maybe it's different. For some people, it's food. But we can try that out. And also power posing. This I have to um, show you. So usually when I give a talk, I like having a, like a wider stance like this, have my two feet firmly planted in the ground. Uh, that's what makes me feel confident. That's what makes me feel powerful. And when you feel good on stage, that's when you give the best talks. I've seen speakers do this the whole time. I'm very impressed by how they can do it. But if that's what makes you comfortable, if that's what gives you strength, go ahead. And another thing um, people mention is humor, right? How do you get your audience engaged? And hopefully nobody's falling asleep right now. Um, it's by humor. But I would want to bring out that if you're not naturally a very funny person and you try to crack your first joke on stage, it usually doesn't work out very well. So rather than us blindly imitating speakers' styles, it's important to find what our style is and be comfortable with it. Now, this one. A little bit scary, no? As Chidi mentioned, that forgetting what to say on stage can be something that holds us back from trying out public speaking. But good thing is we have already learned a few strategies that make us feel less nervous when we're on stage. So we're off to a good start. But what if I told you we can actually prep for the moment we screw up? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, so we can rehearse for forgetting what to say. How do we go about that? First, when we do our dry runs, right, when we practice our talk and we slip, it happens all the time. Instead of restarting your timer and start all over again, try to get back on your feet and think about a good comeback. So that when that happens on stage, you don't freak out because you have already practiced that moment when you slip. Another thing we can do is timing ourselves. For example, if you're giving a 30-minute talk, um, try to prepare 20 to 25 minutes. If you prepare too little, unless you really want to do a very long Q&A, it might get you uh, stressed out because you want to fill up that content. Or if you overshoot and prepare for a very long presentation in that time frame, uh, you might have to ramble and scramble to um, get to the end, and you see your facilitator raising signs, and that usually stresses people out. Now, talking about question and answer as well, um, a lot of people are nervous about having to deal with that because well, what if it's something that I wasn't expecting? But good news is when we're preparing for this presentation, when we're doing all this research, we have read a lot of material on this subject. So even if it doesn't directly hit home, something that you know, we can offer some alternate knowledge to resolve that situation. Or we'll talk a little bit more later about a feedback crew, someone that you can rehearse your talk with, and we can source those questions from them. And another thing that can happen is potential problems on stage. Um, so one thing I try to do is rehearse the presentation without slides. That's something that um, can help. I've seen, uh, for example, the projector not working. And if you have code snippets to show if your entire presentation is that, it gets you into a tough, conversa uh, it, it gets you into a tough situation. Or um, on speaker notes, there is this one time I try presenting, and I rely a lot on it. But unfortunately, the stage setup didn't allow me to look at my speaker notes and my slides at the same time. So I ended up having to have to do this and look here, look there. So it was not a very pleasant experience for both me and I, hope, I think the audience as well. Bring local copies in case the Wi-Fi is bad. But the Wi-Fi has been awesome at EuroPython. Thanks for that. And at the same time, bring your adapters, your dongles. Um, because if you're using a Mac like me, you need 20 adapters to make anything work. <laughs> now, 
What if? What if I actually blank out on stage? Just now I did a social experiment with you. Did anyone actually thought that I blanked out? And I counted, it was around like eight seconds or so, I was drinking water, and it was until the end, people started looking at me funny, you know? What is she doing? So chances are, if you don't straight out tell your audience, I blank out right now, they probably wouldn't even notice. Your talk is 45 minutes long, probably half the people are tuning out right now, it's okay. Like, it happens. So that's a good thing for us. And at the same time, your audience is, in general, supportive. So who here in this audience just really wants to see me screw up this talk? Hands up. Be brave. <laughs> whoa, that's, whoa, that corner, dangerous. <laughs> but as you can see, it's probably not the majority of the audience. Your audience is nice. They want to see you succeed. And worst case scenario, if you couldn't get back on your feet, what happened is they'll clap until you get back on your feet and you can continue. So that's the worst that can happen if you think about it. Now you can also do things like, oh, we skip the slide for now, we'll come back later, or as what I did just now, drinking water, it's also a good strategy to buy you eight to 10 seconds to start thinking clearly. Um, another thing that holds us back is us being afraid to be exposed as a fraud. But I want to bring out this. There are a lot of ways to say I don't know. I've seen speakers doing this on stage, huh? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I've thought a lot about it. Let's talk about it after. Or something like, interesting question. Um, does anyone in the audience want to answer that? You know, there are a lot of things you can do. But still, actually what I want to bring up is, it's okay to say I don't know because you don't have to be the best in a topic to give a talk about it. It's just sharing your learnings. And in fact, I think it would be really boring for you if you're just sharing the same thing over and over again and not learning anything out of it. In fact, the first talk I gave on refactoring, um, the circumstance was one of my colleagues gave me a really good code review on some of the Python patterns. So I was thinking, oh, that's really interesting. I want to dig deeper into it, so I signed up for a talk and I want to learn more about it. So I couldn't claim an expert at that time, but every time I do this talk again, I get some really good questions from the audience and they also point me to great resources. So I learned that way and I hope you will too. Now this one is um, pretty dangerous, not being good enough. So I want to share with you this uh, idea of imposter syndrome. I think a lot of intelligent people have it, so I think I have it too. Um, so this is dangerous because um, uh, for people who have imposter syndrome, uh, our perceived ability, we think we're that good, but we're actually this good. And it's dangerous because we're walking from a lot of opportunities that can stretch ourselves, that can challenge ourselves, just like public speaking. And I really like Mario's quote, right? He told us that your first talk will suck, you get over it. <laughs> so yes, I really like that um, example as well. In fact, one of the interns previously at Yelp, she told me um, she doesn't want to try out public speaking. So I asked her, why is that? She told me she wants to be one of those speakers, those speakers who on stage, whatever they say, she'll believe it. And whatever they sell, she'll buy it. Cool, but you probably get there at your 30th talk. So you gotta start somewhere even though your first talk might suck. That's just how it is. So one phrase that comes into mind is, eyes on the stars, but feet on the ground. Feet on the ground part is important. And it probably went better than you think. Um, one time I was in a public speaking class. The first assignment we had to do was an ad hoc speech. So like, you go, you give a speech about your favorite values or something. Uh, I was talking for one minute straight. I think I was straight out rambling, didn't make a point, very illogical. But then at the same time, they recorded the speech you did. And we watched it um, together as a class. 
And I found out that, hmm, actually, that one minute I was giving a speech, it was better than I expected. I was making some sense. So it probably went better than you think. Now, that leads us to the next question, right? So how good is good enough for us to give a conference talk? Well, luckily, we're all at the conference right now, attend some of these conference talks. You can use that as a reference to see how we need to, how we need to give a speech. But like going to more of these talks, I'm hoping you'll discover this. It's not all of these talks will be engaging to you. And that's great news, because that one talk that you think that wouldn't make it, nobody would be interested in, well, you're at a talk where it's full house and you're not engaged. So it might have a, it might have a shot, you know, it could actually be a hit. Just try it out. So after talking about our fear in public speaking, how good is good enough, let's talk about how we can get better at it. Who here has read the book Lean Startup? Great, it's a great book, isn't it? And the more I like it is because the Lean Startup model, I can apply it to any talk I give. It's really nice. It talks about build, measure, learn, and repeat. So let's apply public speaking into this Lean Startup framework. Let's start with build. How do we build a proposal and a talk that's engaging? one that the organizer will pick me. Just want to debunk a common misconception. Not all meetups, all conferences organizers are swimming in applications. As you remember what Antoine mentioned in the video, he's the organizer for a design meetup, and a lot of his time is used to source candidates to see who is willing to give a talk. So your goal might actually be aligned here. They're looking for a speaker, you're looking for a place to give a talk. But talking about how do you build a proposal that can be easily, more easily accepted. Please do me a favor, pick a topic that you're truly interested in. Because if you picked a topic that can, you can remotely talk for five, 10 minutes, maybe a little bit, well, between the application and your actual talk, you're standing on stage, it might be months. So if you think that you might be you know, willing to give a talk, and when you're standing on stage, you'll fall asleep. So pick something that we're interested in, and that shows in your application. Another thing that might seem obvious, but we can check the call for proposal form first to see what they're looking for. And one very smart idea that I found from Raphael on Twitter is that you can mention that you can modify your talk to a shorter slot, longer slot. So now you're applying for different tracks. That's a very smart idea. I haven't been doing that before. Another thing is to think about the who, what, and how. The more vivid you can let your organizers imagine your talk and how that can bring value to the target audience, the easier it is for your talk to get in. Now, we will also want to leverage on our own experience because that's what makes your talk unique. And for human beings, we actually really want to hear people, um, people's failures. So if you can share some stories or well, engage the audience, you can also share your failures, like your failure using the library, your failure developing, uh, developing software. It tends to gather a lot of attention. That's a lot of build-up to applying for a conference talk. But don't get too discouraged if your talk gets rejected. My talks get rejected all the time. Um, please don't take it too personally, because chances are there are multiple reasons out there. Maybe, well, there are too many people talking about the same topic you're talking about, or they might be looking for a different target audience. A lot of reasons. But good thing in Europe, for PyCon, we have tens, twenties of them. So if it didn't work out for one, we can always try to another one. Now, building the actual talk itself, um, this is my routine. First of all, rubber ducking, we know that um, from programming, it's talking through your code to a person or even a rubber duck. So at some point, you might find out why it's not working. 
I tend to do the same for some of my talks, is to talk out the first ideas to make sure it's in, lo it's in a logical sequence. And then I go bug my feedback crew. Feedback crew is a group of people where you can trust to give you good critical feedback. Don't confuse that with a cheerleading squad. There are people who say, you know, Yenny, this, is, this talk is great, very funny, it's very engaging. They're being polite. <laughs> you want to find people who can actually give you good critical feedback. For example, oh, your joke really doesn't work here, you might want to take it out. Or, oh, these two, li two slides don't seem to make sense together. Do you want to put that into a different section? Something like this. And last is to fine tune our talks by knowing the audience. When your talk gets into a conference, then we'll know better what is the target audience. For example, is it targeting junior developers or more senior ones, then we might want to adjust um, the content. Or is it talking to a non-technical audience, then we might want to change some of the vocabulary. Um, just want to quote Nicola on the dry run thing. So he says, dry run, dry run, dry run. Good news for some people, bad news for the others. Uh, good news is if you think that you can't make it, well, good speakers are usually not born, they practice. Bad news is for people who think that they can wing it and do a very good, good job, well, no, it takes practice. So when you see speakers shine on stage for five, ten minutes, it's a lot of hard work that they put in um, behind them. Ah, so measure. We all want to know how good we are, how can we improve from there. We talked about our feedback crew, how we can gather feedback from them. Another source is your audience. After you give the talk, you can ask them how they went. Or in some conference apps, there are uh, ways for you to evaluate speakers, and we can also get some feedback from there. You can watch um, our own presentation video. It might be a bit difficult because not everybody likes their own voice. But if you want to cut out on filler words like, um, uh, so, all of this, Watching our own presentation video really helps because it annoys you a lot <laughs> to watch it. At the same time, take notes on the questions that you gathered from the audience because they tend to be areas that people are interested in, but you didn't include in your own talk. Learn. This one is actually very interesting. I have been giving this talk already but this little incident happened, and I realized it's actually harder to take feedback than I imagined. The scenario was, after I gave the dry run with my um, feedback crew, right, my colleague gave me some suggestions to improve. He told me, hey, your presentation style seemed a bit hectic, unlike usual. I was thinking, hectic? Are you kidding me? Like, I spent so much time rehearsing for this talk, and hectic was what I got, but okay. This is something I'm still trying to get the hang of. There are two mindsets we're talking about. First of all, it's the fixed mindset, no? At this point, how am I doing? Then I would have thought, you know, bummer, I totally messed it up, now my colleague must think that I wasn't prepared at all. That's the fixed mindset. But if I have more of a growth mindset, then I would be thinking, I'm grateful that my colleague gave me that piece of advice, now my real talk is gonna go much better. And between the fixed mindset and growth mindset, which one do you think it helps me get to my goal? Obviously, the growth mindset. But yes, it's easier said than done. At the same time, um, getting these uh, feedback, right? What are the action items? It also depends a lot on the time frame. For example, if someone gave you this feedback the night before the talk, it might be better to just not take that advice because it's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stress if you need to digress from what you have rehearsed. So if we have action items, try to take them uh, one at a time and also prioritize them and not to overwhelm ourselves with the feedback. Now the most important part is to repeat. One thing we can do, since we have prepared so much, put in so much effort to make this talk good, next time we can give it again so that we can um, get better from our experience.
Now jumping to the more practical part is where can we get started? How do we find these opportunities to practice public speaking? There are a lot of opportunities around us. It doesn't have to be you speaking on stage. It can be stand-ups, team meetings, presentations at your company, or even giving a speech at a party. As long as you have that spotlight on you, you're on, you're practicing public speaking. One thing I also think about is if it's an internal opportunity or external. Internal, given that it's your company, your school. External might be conferences, meetups. So personally, I enjoy better the external uh, speaking opportunities because I tend to know less of the attendees. No offense, but it's better that um, I talk to someone I don't know and I feel less conscious. I want to get to know you all, but maybe after the talk. Um, another thing is uh, try to sign up for conferences in first-time speaker-friendly conferences. Uh, shameless plug right here. So me and my friend Teresa were organizing a conference called Python Pizza. It's going to be in Hamburg in November. So if you want to try out <laughs> your talk for the first time, it's definitely very first-time speaker-friendly. It will be a very fun crowd. And at the same time, going to local meetups, or if you're from an underrepresented group in tech, uh, there are a lot of meetups for us to go to as well, and the audience tends to be even more friendlier. Um, some people approach me asking about public speaking groups or classes. Is that something we want to do? I would say anything helps, right? Essentially, giving a talk is testing your confidence. So if you go for improv, drama, it also has the same theory on that aspect. But if you want to learn how to run, you don't go swim. So if you don't work out very well with an improv group, it doesn't mean that you cannot give a prepared presentation. It's essentially two different things in that aspect. Great, so we have covered some contents today. We talked about the why of public speaking, how can we feel less afraid overcoming that fear? How do we get better? And practically, where do we get started? These are the references that helped me prepare for the talk. So if you're interested, you can also look up more of these resources. And before we close, I encourage you to apply for a public speaking opportunity within these two weeks and get started now. Because if not now, then when? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I, thanks for the keynote. Um, so we have questions. We have microphones all over the place. So now you can queue up and make your first, very first speaker presentation by asking a question, maybe. Hello. Oh, who has a question? Hello. Oh, yeah, where? Oh, here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> first question. Hello. Um, you mentioned you repeat your talks. Mm -hmm. um, how, like, do you stay interested in the talks you're giving? <laughs> like, I, I, so, so my problem with that Mm -hmm. with public speaking is that I'm only interested in giving a talk that I don't know at the beginning what I'm going to talk about and at the moment, the moment that I give it for the first time, then it's boring. Mm. Okay. No, I think that's a good point. And just want to reiterate, that's why um, I tend to pick something that I'm really interested in before getting committed to that. And preparing for the talk also takes a lot of time and effort, right? Um, but at the same time, one thing I look into is how to perfect that talk. For example, um, I talk to the audience afterwards from Q&A, right? Like, I get a lot of uh, interesting information about what I can do to improve. And I tend to incorporate that into the next talk to keep it interesting. So like, every time I have a little bit of new content here and there. So that's how I keep myself engaged. Okay. More questions? Yes. Hi. Congratulations, and thank you for the excellent speaking. Thank you. Uh, I know that it should be a question, not really a, a talking, but I'd like to make a comment of a comment of our colleague. <laughs> uh, because I have basically the opposite approach of him. I love to talk about something that uh, I don't knew before. Mm -hmm. 
And first time I do, th I do that, when I finish, I say, my God, what's horrible. I have to, f to beautify these, these, and these. I had, had to have that, that reference. So if I have the opportunity to give the same talk for the 20th time, all of them would be different and hopefully a little bit better. Uh, we are human, uh, human beings, we are all of us different, and I believe any one of us um, would have different approaches to the, to the uh, same questions. So, but to avoid getting out without asking a question, <laughs> are you feeling fear at this exact moment? Mm. Good question. I think in the beginning, yes. Um, in fact, I was about to make a joke about taking my pulse, but I forgot. Probably because I was too nervous. <laughs> but, so it's a good time for your joke. <laughs> <laughs> right, but at the same time, as I mentioned, um, getting into your harbor and talking about something you're familiar with. For example, on public speaking, a topic that I, um, I'm really interested in, at some point I forget that I'm talking in front of a big audience, and it gets better. So I guess right now, at this very moment, I'm less nervous than I was before. OK. Uh. Thank you very much, Jenny. So uh, who's, who's actually uh, planning? Who, can we, we have some time left, so let's ask. Who has given at least one talk in his life? Please. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> OK. And, 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 and now we have to check. Who has never given a talk before? Not. Not. Come on, this is not the... Uh, I mean, we, we can do the math, okay. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's at least one third of the conference, interesting. So um, thank you again for Jenny for inspiring to give everybody once in their lifetime at least one good talk. Uh, and, and, and yeah, thank, thanks for coming by and glad to have you around. Thank you. Thank you for having me.